Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on magnetostatics. This is video number six, and I'm going to discuss the magnetic vector potential, which is capital A. There are many videos previous to this which are relevant, and I've written those in the bottom left of your screen. The most important of those are videos 45 and 46 in my series on vector calculus for electromagnetism, where I discuss the Helmholtz theorem, and also video 19 in electrostatics, where I discussed the electrostatic potential. Now the reason video number 19 from electrostatics is so important is that I put a lot of effort into introducing the theory behind the use of potentials and I feel that if you can fully understand video 19 on electrostatics it'll very much help you in understanding this video a lot quicker as in specifically video 6 on magnetostatics. So let's begin. When we discussed Helmholtz, the Helmholtz theorem we, we saw the following. An arbitrary vector field, which I'm going to call capital F, can always be decomposed into the sum, or perhaps you could call it the difference, of the gradient of a scalar field, which I'm going to call U, and the curl of a vector field, which I'm going to call W. The minus here in front of the gradient of U is largely a matter of convention, and I wouldn't worry about it. Now, the scalar field U and the vector field W have their own functional forms, whereas u is the divergence of the, the vector field f and w is its curl. Now let's try and calculate the Helmholtz theorem when we, just, when we use it on the magnetic field. So the magnetic field has a zero divergence. We found that in the previous video. I'm going to call that Gauss's law for magnetism. Some people say it's, it's an un, unnamed equation but I prefer to call it Gauss's law for magnetism. So if this is the case that the divergence of B is zero, that means we cannot invoke a scalar potential for the magnetic field because the divergence of the magnetic field up here is going to be equal to zero. What this means is that the only potential we can use is the vector potential. And the vector potential at the moment is given the placeholder W, but in a moment we'll see that in actual fact for magnetism we call it capital A. So, this equation here says that the magnetic field cannot be represented as a scalar potential only, but rather as a vector potential, where we take the curl of the vector potential, and we've called it W so far. But I'm going to tell you that in a moment we'll see that we actually give it the placeholder capital A. So we call U the scalar potential and W the vector potential. So here the scalar potential is zero, but the vector potential is non-zero. This is in contrast to electrostatics, and the reason this is because in electrostatics we saw the curl of the electrostatic field was zero. What this meant was that we couldn't employ a vector potential. But the divergence of the electric field is non-zero, which allowed us to employ a scalar potential. So the magnetic field is different in this particular case. So for completeness, I've written the full functional form of u, w, uh, u and w on the top right of your screen. So they're there for reference more than anything else. Note that the divergence of B is zero, and I'd like to discuss very briefly its physical significance. Basically, the divergence of B is the flux of the magnetic field. So this is zero, so that means there is no flux. But we know flux is a result of sources. So since B has, is divergenceless, and there are there is no flux, we must conclude that there exist no magnetic sources or charges or monopoles. So there are no sources of, magnetic, uh, of, uh, of magnetism other than moving electric charges. So we don't have, we'll say, a magnetic charge or magnetic uh, charge or magnetic pole. So that's an, that's an important thing to appreciate. So let's move on. We call, as I said a moment ago, capital W the magnetic vector potential, and we give it instead the placeholder capital A when we talk about magnetism. So we can say now that the magnetic field can be written as a vector potential, where we have, or excuse me, as the curl of the vector potential. And specifically, the vector potential capital A is mu zero over four pi outside of the volume integral of the volume current density d tau prime over the magnitude of the separation vector. Now, there is something very important which I'd like to uh, point out to you. 
What would happen if we took the curl of the magnetic field where we represent it as the curl of the, ma of the uh, vector potential? So you have the curl of the magnetic field is the double curl of the vector potential. Now we can rewrite this using one of our vector product rules as the gradient of the divergence minus the Laplacian of A. Now I'm just going to tell you, and you can accept it at the moment, that we usually eliminate the term where we have the gradient of the divergence of the magnetic vector potential. And when we do this, we speak of gauge transformations. So for this reason, we can usually write the magnetic vector potential in terms of Poisson's equation. So we take the Laplacian of A is minus mu zero times J. All right, so let's move on. So writing the magnetic vector potential in terms of the volume current density, the surface current density, and the line, char the line density, or the current itself, we get the following three equations. So extending to, the, to k and to i shouldn't be a big deal for you. Now, the magnetic vector potential is a real physical quantity. But unfortunately, unlike the electric scalar potential, there is no intuitive explanation as there was, like I said, for the electric potential. So for this reason, we mainly use it as an aid to calculating the magnetic field. For very much so, with the electric potential, we used it to do everything because it made life so much easier. And we talked about it as being the electric potential energy per unit charge. Finally, we've already discussed the electric scalar potential but I didn't mention an ambiguity, uh, an ambiguity that exists, and now is as good a time as ever to do that. We were able to write the electric field as minus the gradient of the scalar potential, and we call the scalar potential for electric fields V. Now, what happens if we have a new potential V prime? And all I've done to differentiate V from V prime is at a constant, let's say V zero. We know, of course, that the gradient of a scalar or gradient of a constant is, is zero. So in this case, the gradient of v, the v zero is going to be zero. So if we take the gradient of V prime, we're going to get back the gradient of V, which is going to give us the exact same electric field. This is a bit odd. It seems that we can have two different values for the potential and yet give us the same value of the electric field. So this shouldn't be a surprise to you, having seen what happens with the magnetic vector potential where we had an ambiguity in that we could add the gradient of the divergence of A and we would get back uh, we would get back the same value of A. And I spoke about a gauge transformation there. And it's something I will do in, in much greater detail in a later video. So we can always add a constant to the electric potential and we will still have the same value for the electric field. And that's just an important thing to know. And we discuss this in terms of gauge transformations at a, a later stage. So to illustrate it for the magnetic vector potential, we have the following. We know that the curl of the magnetic vector potential is equal to the magnetic field. So we know, of course, that we can add the gradient of any scalar field and still get the same magnetic field. So let's just illustrate that. Let's say we have a new magnetic vector potential A prime. And that's just the previous value of, of A plus the gradient of some scalar field, which we're going to call lambda. So let's calculate the magnetic field associated with this new magnetic vector potential. So we're going to take the curl of A plus lambda, excuse me, the gradient of lambda. But the curl of the gradient is always zero. So what happens is we get the same value of the magnetic field. The point is that we're able to add the gradient of any scalar field to the magnetic vector potential and get back the same magnetic field. So there is an ambiguity there. And like I said three times now, I will discuss this topic at a later stage and we speak of gauge transformations. The last thing I'll say, and is it's very much just a reminder to try and hammer home that magnetism is caused by moving electric charges. As far as we're aware, there are in fact no magnetic monopoles or sources of the magnetic field. And this is very much at odds with general relativity. So thanks for watching, please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.